Hey everyone, it's been over two minutes and I haven't been raped yet. Looks like a good day. Well, it's a better day than the one that Mattress Girl is having. Stop playing. Break free from your chains. To break free from your cage. What we don't want to do is go back to a traditionalist world. Hi, I'm Diana Davison. I'm going to start out with some current events because it's relevant to today's discussion. And uh, last week I did a video talking about victim culture and how these people aren't survivors, uh, like they claim, and why they benefit from the mantle of being a victim. So um, there's a character who I'm just going to call Mattress Girl. I'm not going to even say her real name because she's now just Mattress Girl, who spent her time in university making an art project out of what she claims was a rape. Now, this rape was actually put before the, the board at the university, and they are uh, required to find guilt if there's even the slightest chance they did not find guilt. But she has gone on and, and actually made this one of her art projects. She's gone on to carry a mattress around the campus with her in order to, uh, you know, make herself famous out of victimhood. She even brought the mattress to graduation, which is ridiculous. Now she's graduated, what's a girl to do, all right? What's a victim to do? She has gone and done a porn video, basically, which is called an art video, which reenacts her rape. So let's say this thing actually happened and she is so unwilling to move on. She's done a video reenacting it and she's now put images on the internet of herself completely naked and uh, did it with four different cameras. I think that, you know, a good art project, she would have just used three because there's really, you know, there's something about three that really makes magic out of art. Um, and perhaps in the fourth camera, she should have just had a violin playing. So now that she's out of school, what's Mattress Girl going to do? She's going to continue being a victim. Why? Why is this? Now, I've been reading a few things. Actually, I wrote an article based on this, this first link that I'll put below, the Zura Institute. I wrote an article called uh, Victim Nation about a year and a half ago, and uh, I still find that stuff relevant. I don't agree with everything on Azure's uh, site, but he describes the power behind the victim narrative as such. The victim's basic stance is that he or she is not responsible for what happened, is always morally right, is not accountable, is forever entitled to sympathy, is justified in feeling moral indignation for being wronged. Now he's put in five points. I think that we can condense that down to the main three. That they are not responsible or accountable in any way for playing a role in what happened to them. That they are always morally right and uh, are indignant about it. And that they are forever entitled to sympathy. Now Mattress Girl is counting on that last one. She does not want to move on from this event because She's had her five minutes of fame and she has decided to make a career out of it. And that career counts on victim culture and the, her right to forever ask for sympathy and attention. And probably at this point now, money for her um, choice to take on this victimhood mantle. So let's look at the problems that are presented by victimhood. First of all, the Zura Institute link that I put below talks about the problems of the don't blame the victim approach. Now, it's not to say that a victim is actually entirely to blame for what happened to them, but if you take this um, victimhood stance, what you're doing is saying that everything in your life is external to you, it's all things that happen to you, and you play no part in it. And anyone who accepts this idea basically makes themselves into a helpless person. They um, rightfully would be afraid of everything in the world around them. Now, there's reason to be afraid of leaving your front door. Actually, you could stay in the house and it might burn down as well. But we are all going to die. This is something we have to face. And you can go through life being afraid of it all the time, or you can join the rest of the world and go out there, take your chances, and do your best. So, when things happen to you, Potentially, there's nothing you could have done to have prevented that, but there's always something you can do to learn from it. You can grow as a person. And actually, one of my favorite comedians, Simon Amstel, British comic, very underrated, 
has this to say. The only reason comedy exists is because we have tragedy. That's the way it works. Tragedy plus time equals comedy. Although, that's not the... I realise what the, the formula really should be is tragedy plus time plus joke. <laughs> you can't just be involved in horrific tragedy <laughs> and wait. All right, so the morality issue. Victims come to you from the point of view of, I'm going to tell you something that requires you to then do things for me, to compensate me for my misery. And if you don't, and if you don't care, or if you're too busy, then you're an immoral person. And there are demands upon our morality coming from every direction. Now, if you look at the way small groups, um, groups of friends, deal with somebody who is constantly... Um, putting you on trial or demanding things of you, they're just basically, they're the whiners, the complainers, and the people who bring nothing to the table except for demands from you. They are essentially energy vampires. In small groups, what happens is they go on Skype and for some curious reason, nobody's online. They text you and they might hear back from you a week later, oh, sorry, I was out of town or I was really busy. I had some things going on. And you basically just stop being available to them. Nobody wants to hang out with them anymore. And then they either figure out why, or they have to go find themselves a new social group. When you take this to a government level, the government unfortunately can't just mark themselves invisible on Skype. The government can't um, be on, uh, on break or on holiday for the entire year. And the government is supposed to prove that they are moral and they're supposed to do things to show that they're taking care of people. So they're kind of on the hook. They have to respond to these people. But the government, of course, is not an individual. The government is basically um, all of our resources that are sucked into one body that's put in charge of them. So victimhood, where it wouldn't work on the smaller scale, is quite successful on the government scale. I'm going to link to another article below, which, again, I don't agree with everything that he says in there, but he gets into a lot of detail about the problems that are presented for government by these victim culture groups and the, the growing number of them. Um, there's a, a calculation that there's 109% of the population is oppressed when you take intersectionality into account. And uh, there's actually other people who say it's more like 400%. And they are all making demands of the communal resources. Now, government is essentially... Um, in charge of resources. Now, in, in thinking about morality, there are some people who have spent their careers researching human evil and um, how it is that people end up doing the types of horrible things to each other that the victimhood culture is trying to make so prominent. And um, they've got this utopian ideal that, that we can create a culture in which nothing bad happens, no rape happens, no murder happens, you know, which is just ridiculous. But there are people who have studied uh, human nature in terms of why we do these so-called evil things, these immoral things. And an, an interesting theory that I came across with Ernest Becker in Escape from Evil is that he says um, the problem started when, you know, communities didn't have excess. And it um, came to a point where, like, when they did create excess, it was sacrificed to the gods and it, there was no... Um, excess resources to be doled out. But at some point, the religious leaders who were in charge of the surplus um, realized that there was power to be had from how they went about doling out the surplus. And so they kind of got high on the power of being in charge of the surplus, and then other people got sort of, you know, high on their ability to obtain extra surplus for themselves. And he actually traces back the, um, you know, whole political... Um, nightmare that we're looking at now um, went from the religious leaders became politicians and it, it all connects to the, the source of it he says is surplus in society and putting that surplus into the hands of a few people interesting idea uh, anyone who hasn't heard me talk about Ernest Becker I really suggest that you check him out there's also people who are advancing his research um, under the name terror management theory so I'll put links to that below as well so uh, let's moving on to the third part. All right, so the third part is that you know this bad thing happened to somebody, and instead of moving forward and learning from that event, they want you to forever owe them something because of it, and they don't want to actually figure out what they can do to change the future of whether or not this thing will recur in their life. 
And uh, I'm going to use a little clip from Seinfeld, actually, that uh, you know it will hopefully put into perspective for people not just the role they play in their own victimhood in many circumstances, but how other people feel about it when they complain. Referred to as the soup Nazi. Why? What happens if you don't order right? He yells, and you don't get your soup. What? Just follow the ordering procedure, and you will be fine. All right, all right. <laughs> I didn't get any bread. Just forget it. Let it go. <laughs> um, excuse me. Uh, I think you forgot my bread. Bread? Two dollars extra. Two dollars? But everyone in front of me got free bread. You want bread? Yes, please. Three dollars! <laughs> what? No soup for you! <laughs> how does he do it? <laughs> you know, I don't see how you can sit there reading that and not even offer me any. I gave you a taste. What do you want? Why can't we share? I told you not to say anything. You can't go in there, brazenly flout the rules, and then think I'm going to share with you. All right, so I'm going to cut this a little bit short tonight because I've been doing this really fun show. It's called The Freedom Fiends. I'll put a link to that below, and I'm going to be on air tonight, so I have to get this filmed, cut, and uploaded so um, I can have my internet free for the show. So anyways, hope you check it out. It's um, you know, a really great show. The show not worth fact-checking. And uh, we just have a lot of fun on it. So I'm going to leave you, I guess, with the rape joke of the week. There was a report on the BBC that three girls were raped in their flats. Okay. I prefer mine in heels, but...